Well, if John was anything, he was a spiritual person, yeah? Do we, do we, I mean, he, it's in his songs, it's in his demeanour, it's in his desire. You just have to walk down to the John Denver Park, and that peace that's there is a spiritual thing. And what these 10 oxidating pictures are is a series of pictures that describe the arc of the spiritual life. Because a lot of people say, I'm not spiritual at all. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, there's no such thing as God or whatever you like to call it. You know, there's nothing there. And it, the, the, the ten oxen pictures start at that particular point. And if you look at the, your little brochure that you've got, which is just in front of you, um, that first picture, searching for the ox, that's really when we're wandering around thinking, oh gosh, you know, what's this life all about? You know, what, what am I going to do with my life? You know, I'm anxious. You know, I want to do this and blah, blah, blah. You know, is there anything more to life? That's the first bit. Is there anything more to life? So the little oxhead is like wandering around with his whip. He's got his, he's got his little whip, which actually tells him that there is something more to his life. He said, what's this for? This whip? He's looking for the ox. And the ox is your true nature. If you like to call it God or the, the, the ground of being or the, the peace within that's what he's looking for. He's looking for that. So the next bit, number two, if you look at that, is when he thinks, ah, he listens to a song that John's written. He thinks, yes, yeah. I can hear the spirituality in it. Or he, he reads something or he, he, noti he notices the possibility that there could be something else in life. And so he, it's called seeing the traces. You know when you start to think, oh, there's this and there's that and there's this and maybe there is something else in life. Maybe there's another way, you know, that I could go. And so the second oxiding picture is noticing the traces. And then the third oxiding picture, this, is, this, this bit here is like previously on. So I, I'm just telling you where we've got to up to now. The third oxiding picture is seeing the ox. That's that moment when you suddenly think, right, there is such a thing as a spiritual side of life. You know, I, I've got a sense of it. I've, 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 you know, I've seen, had an experience of that inner spirituality. I'm absolutely certain that there is a spiritual side of life. And lots of people have different experiences that way. It could be in music. It could be a beautiful view. It, you know, it could be some intoxication. It could be anything that you like. But you get a sense that suddenly... There is something there. So we're now at number four. And if you look at number four on your, your thing, you can see it's called, number four is called Catching the Ox. And with each of these, this is what they do in these, it's like, but they have a bit of scripture in it with these Zen pictures. They have the picture and then some Zen master 500 years ago. These were all done you, you know, over a thousand years ago, these pictures were painted. And they're all different, actually. There's a different one of number five, a different version of it. And if you look at this up here, you'll see other different versions. You know, there are different versions of the painting. But number, this one we're at, number four, the little bit of writing says, Lost long in the wilderness, the boy has at last found the ox. In other words, he's found his true nature. He's found his meaning and purpose in life. And his hands are on him. But owing to the overwhelming pressure of the outside world, the ox is hard to keep under control. He constantly longs for the sweet-scented field. The wild nature is still unruly and altogether refuses to be broken. If the ox herd wishes to see the ox completely in harmony with himself, he surely must use the whip freely. I'll explain this in a moment. <laughs> With the energy of his whole being, the boy has at last taken hold of the ox. But how wild his will, how ungovernable his power. A time he struts up a plateau, when lo, he is lost again in the midst of an unpenetrable mountain pass. So the main change here from last week, for those who were here last week, is he's not just seen the ox. He's not just seen the spirituality, his true nature, He's actually caught hold of it. And you can see with the picture that the rope is around the ox and the boy has his hands on the ox. It's not just a glimpse. 
Now it's a dynamic change because he's holding it and it's because he's having to hold it, it's affecting his whole life. He has to concentrate on it. He's not just wandering on his own now. He's become attached to it. He and his true nature have come together in a way that changes his life completely. It's like being struck by love. You know when you fall in love? Okay, let's see. Who here has fallen in love? Yeah, look at I mean, why not? It's like, it's like falling in love. When you're in love, your life changes utterly, doesn't it? You were wandering along, going to work, and you know, you don't go, and suddenly you bang, you fall in love. And it's like, oh, I wonder what he's doing now. I wonder what she's doing now. Yes. Which like, your whole attention is on that particular thing, the falling in love bit, the object of your love. And just like the whole spiritual side, you know, everybody wants to be in love. You know, everybody wants to be in love. And everyone wants to have that central experience in their spiritual nature. And the desire to be in love and the desire for enlightenment, if you like, is what keeps us going. It's, it's the pursuit of it that keeps us going. And then when we fall in love or when we glimpse the ox... Your, your lover, you're smitten. And then it is the energy of the love that keeps you going. I mean, you know, when you're in love, you can spend all night talking about nothing, can't you? Sitting up there, with, in my day, it was with a packet of fags and a glass of wine. And you can spend all night just talking to that person. And it's the same with the spiritual thing. Once you get that spiritual thing, you can actually, you're smitten by the beauty of that spiritual vision. I think John was smitten by the beauty of the spiritual vision. In both cases, of falling in love and with the spiritual side, it changes you. There was a Zen priest that wrote, with one glance at the figure of Miss Original Face. Now, your true nature or your spiritual enlightenment is known as your original face in Zen terms. So, so that's what it's called. With one glance... At the figure of Miss Original Face standing there, you will fall in love with her. And being smitten by what is seen, the boy catches the bull. Or has the bull caught him? Because actually, you know, there is a thought that our true nature, that that God inside us is always calling to us, that the universe is always, always calling to us. You know, the universe is calling to us in the heart of John's music. That's why you're here today. You're called by something in that music. And you're actually called by John's heart, which is, that's it. and John's heart is called by that nature, divine nature in the universe. The universe is calling us. So it's possible that the, the ox, like with the lover, is, has been sort of playing a game with the, the boy and saying, you know, come to me, and he's caught the boy. You talk about people catching religion, and it's when they, they get caught by it. But hey, you know, the boy and, and the ox are caught up together, and the boy's life will never be the same. And like any love story, it's going to be a bumpy ride from the start. <laughs> I mean, it's not just I fall in love, I fall more in love, I fall more in love. It's no, it's I fall in love and he stood me up, you know, yeah, they say, oh, oh, why didn't he pay attention to the fact that I wanted this? I didn't want to go to this restaurant. And you get this whole bumpiness that goes on. And that bumpiness does go on in the whole spiritual life as well. You, you get the spiritual bug and think, oh no, I don't want you. Know, you know, it goes like that. And the first thing I want to say is that, um, that this struggle you know, to be with our true nature is not just something that takes place in our spiritual practice, if you've got a spiritual practice, or in chapel or whatever it is. It doesn't just take place in that spiritual practice. The spiritual practice, if you do meditation, is real as any other part of your life. But in those circum but because we're controlling the circumstances, you know, these circumstances here are controlled. It's, good to, it's always good to feel great in a commun spiritual community because you can think, oh, yeah, no one's going to rush in, hopefully. And, you know, the, the, the lights are on, the heating's on. It's all controlled. And therefore, you can be at peace in those situations. 
In meditation, we sit in a quiet room. We might have a candle going. I've got a candle here. You know, some incense burning, a particular picture in front of us. And then we challenge ourselves to be in our hearts rather than our minds. We challenge ourselves to be spiritual. We create the conditions for our true nature to appear in front of us. But the real struggle, and we all know this, and it's the same with love. The real struggle is in day-to-day living. And it's here that we're overwhelmed by the pressure of the outside world. And it makes us difficult to control the ox. It makes us difficult to, to stay in our true nature. It says in that little poem, He constantly longs for the old sweet-scented field. The wild nature is still unruly and altogether refuses to be broken. And what that means is that it... it that we keep on going back to our old habits, even if we have got on that spiritual chat, track. And this brings out a question of our true, about our true nature, which is why, is, the, why is it difficult for us? Surely, if we're in touch with our true nature, we'll be, we'll be calm. You know, I, I'm supposed to be a minister. I'm supposed to be calm in my life. I'm not supposed to shout at my children. I, I'm not supposed to do all that sort of business. And... You know, how come that is the situation? Well, I think the thing we have to realize is that our minds, our minds and all the stuff that makes us sort of go off in different directions are just as much a part of our true nature as the bit of our heart that makes us quiet and peaceful. There's a lovely bit from the Hindu scripture, the Upanishads, and it's just an analogy. It says... Like two birds of golden plumage, inseparable companions, the individual self, the mind, and the immortal self, the heart, are perched on the branches of the self-same tree. The former, the mind, tastes the sweet and bitter fruits of the tree, and the heart just calmly observes. The individual self, the mind, is deluded by forgetfulness of his identity with the divine self, bewildered by his ego, grieves and is sad. But when he recognizes the true self, he grieves no more. Seeing him present in all, the wise man is humble and does not put himself forward. And what that really means is that your mind is just as much a part of your spiritual life as your heart is. Even though your mind takes you in different directions, we should include our minds. Ram Dass. Who's heard of Ram Dass? Anyone here? Yeah. Ram Dass says, on your spiritual journey, you go from your spirituality being in service to your psychodynamics, your mind, your spirituality being in service to your psychodynamics, to your psychodynamics, your mind being in service to your spiritual journey. That is the change we have to make. It's not just the journey from the heart to the mind. It is the journey that includes both the heart and the mind. And that's the stage we're at at the moment. It's this struggle in the tree that we, that we have. And, you know, you can see that struggle in John's life. He had that struggle in his life, the difficult things that he had to deal with. His, his desire to come back to his heart and then being taken away in a different direction. But again, it's not getting rid of our demons. It's about including them. And it's here that we have to be aware of our day-to-day life. Who's heard of Thich Nhat Hanh? Anybody? Yeah. Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, uh, he's a Buddhist guy, and he said, spiritual practice is not just sitting and meditating. Practice is looking, thinking, touching, drinking, eating, and talking. Every act, every breath, Every step can be be a practice and can help us become more of ourselves. And you can see that in the picture with the ox herd holding the rope. That's him doing his practice in the field. And we do often lose it. My exercise is running in Crown Park. Who, Who knows Crown Park? Anyway, it's a big park down the road. And the bane of my existence is dogs. I'm running along in Crown Park. This is a true story. The other day, you know, whenever I'm running in Crown Park, you know, I get chased by dogs. Uh, and you know, the other day I was running in Crown Park, and this dog came, uh, and I bit me on, on the side here, drew blood. Uh, you know, blood coming out. Poor old Heather came back, I was pouring with blood like this. And when 
that happens, I turn around and go, what are you doing? Can you please control your dog? I completely lose it. You know, I'm not, you know, I expect them to say, hey, hang on, aren't you the minister at the Aspen Chapel? Shouldn't you just be a calm person just going along? Why are you shouting? But they never recognize me. I have my hat on and my dark glasses. You know. But the thing is, I lose it at that point. And we all do lose it at different points. And suddenly, you know, like the ox, my old habits come back. My children, if they're here, will tell you, yes, he does shout at me as well. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's that difficulty of running, you know, you know, that's when you have to start to discipline yourself. If the ox herd wishes to see the ox completely at harmony with himself, he is surely to use the whip freely. And I was running yesterday, and I was running along, and I was thinking, Right, I'm doing this sermon tomorrow. I'm going to be talking about this. Now, if a dog comes up and starts, you know, barking at me, I'm going to turn around and be very calm with the dog. Luckily, it wasn't tested yesterday, but, but, I, but I'm going to have to try and see. And it's here we have to, for some of you, it might be road rage. You know, when you're cut up and suddenly you just flip and, and you, your partner turns around and looks at you and says, where did that come from? You know, for others, it's reaching for a drink or being riled in a political debate, or, or lashing out when we get angry, or, or falling into a sloth of de despondency. It's all about our reactivity. The ox, our minds, pulling this way and that, constantly longing for the sweet-scented fields. But without the discipline, nothing really changes. Even after we've seen, you know, the, 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 that, that spiritual center. I talked last week about my, I had a big experience. The reason I'm here now is, you know, I had a big experience when I, in 1979. That must make me three when I had my big experience, I know. But I had a big experience in 1979, and it really, it was one of those seeing the light experiences, you know, wow, one of those ones. And it totally changed my life. And I went from, I was working in advertising, I went to that, and I went on to the spiritual route, and you know, here I am. But you know, the quality of my life really didn't change after that experience. I was still, you know, going to parties, smoking, drinking, you know, I did all the same stuff. It, it didn't really affect my inner self in, in any direction. What changed for me do you need a couple of seats? Are you there? Do you need, can we find a couple of seats for these two people here as well? That would be, be great. Yeah. What changed for me was um, when I started doing a practice, doing meditation and stuff like that. And then I began to sort of dig in. I began to actually work on my inner being, my inner self, and change the way that I became. And there's an old phrase here. Some of you probably heard this before. Watch your thoughts they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. And so you can see how it goes from the mind right the way through. And that's why we've got to actually watch what we do. We have to, that's the struggle in the spiritual life, to keep watching. It's like, you know, who's trained puppies? Who's trained, I mean, you know what it's like, you know, it takes forever to train them not to poo on the kitchen floor, and you have to keep going. And it's the same with ourselves. We have to keep going. We have to make sure, and it's even if it's little by little to do that. Now, I'm going to end with a little story. I like Zen This is the end now, so you can relax. But I'm going to end with a Zen story. I like guru stories, because they sort of give us an idea of what, what this is. This is a guru story. So, so I, I'm going to end with this. Um, uh, okay, yeah. Once upon a time, there was a young man of deep filial piety who unfortunately suffered the loss of both his parents. Both his parents died. He felt a deep gratitude towards his parents, but they'd already died. He wondered if there's not some way that he could express his, express his deep gratitude and feelings, the ones he felt inside. Now, at that time, there was a wealthy couple who had many rice fields, much land, a great fortune, but sadly no children. They circulated a notice around the villages on which they wrote, 
It is now necessary for us to think about how we will maintain our family lineage. We are willing to bequeath all our property to any conscientious young person who is willing to care for us in our old age. We wish to adopt a person of deep filial piety who will ultimately be the beneficiary of our property. Please assemble if you are interested. So many people gathered. The wealthy man then proceeded to test the mental ability of the people he'd gathered. Almost everybody failed the test, and then only 10 people remained. (coughs) Next, he led the remaining people, each one to a different well, a well, and he explained to them, draw water from this well using this bottomless bucket and fill the well by tomorrow morning. No matter how many times you draw water with a bottomless bucket, you cannot fill the barrel. And most people then and there just threw up their hands and left. Only one person remained. The young man whose heart was so full of the unexpressed gratitude he felt towards his parents. He didn't think as to whether or not the barrel was getting filled or not with water. He knew only what he'd been told to do by the old gentleman. And in complete innocence, he drew water from the bottomless bucket one or two drops at a time. And by morning, the barrel was full. Only one person had had become a complete fool and heedless of whether or not it was possible, done exactly what he'd been told to do. It goes without saying that the wealthy couple adopted him as their son. And we have to be willing to be a fool for love filling our buckets one drop at a time, if that's what it takes, until gradually the ox, our spiritual life, reveals itself more and more. And notice in this picture, it's the whole ox rather than a little bit. The previous one had only a little part sight of him. And in the training we do, the struggle starts to create intuition, an intuition in us that's beyond thought and emotion, And that is what develops our ability to proceed to the next step. So if you're here, we're going to talk about that next week. And if you want more of that, you can pick up one of these little things at the back. And that tells you how to get these messages if you want them.